Hi, I'm Ed Sperling. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Semiconductor Engineering. I'm over at Synopsys with Fadi Mamari, who's going to talk today about using static analysis for functional safety. Fadi, in the past we have not used static analysis for functional safety. What's changed? Uh, yes, what's changed is the type of design that is happening today that requires functional safety. In the past, you know, we, we you know, it was used uh, for things like, uh, uh, you know, avionics, uh, in space uh, for automotive, but for more modest uh, chips functionally, ECUs, things like that. And what's happening now is uh, with self-driving cars, uh, you know, the, the computing power that is required for, you know, for these applications is, is enormous. And, and uh, so the chips are designed with the latest technology. We're talking five, seven nanometers, and they're huge. And, and so some of the techniques we've used in the past for functional safety are not scaling anymore. So we need new solutions, new approaches, so we have a lot of these tools already, right? I mean, they exist for the most advanced nodes, but they haven't been applied in this space before. That's right. So static analysis has been used in, in many areas, the linting, clock domain crossing, uh, DFT for early analysis. Of course, static timing analysis has been a mainstay for several years. Uh, it has not been used traditionally for functional safety. And uh, it's, it's a natural evolution now, right? So we, we need... Um, uh, to do several things in functional safety with the chips that I mentioned earlier. We need to be able to do uh, a shift left, do the analysis earlier. We need to scale, uh, so to run these analysis tools on very, very large designs. And we also need to be able to enable architectural exploration. And that means that have a mechanism for the, for the user to look at the analysis, extract meaningful information to make choices uh, uh, with respect to functional safety. That means you know, which uh, modules are, are hotspots for me, which modules are, are the ones that require more functional safety elements. If they do require functional safety, which uh, types of functional safety elements should I put in? And have the ability to iterate uh, until a good result is achieved and then go into the implementation flow. Why don't you draw this out for us? Sure, of course, I'd be happy to. So let's dig down into this. Absolutely. So typically, a user starts with RTL. And um, in a functional safety, we're interested about uh, the functional mode of the operation. So there will be some modal constraints. Um, that, uh, you know, what, what are the signals that are either one or zero to put the design in functional mode? So that's important information to have. And then the user may have also some functional safety mechanism already existing. Could be some ECC. Uh, some dual core lockstep, perhaps. Um, and if the user does have that, have that already in the RTL, they can be specified and we'll take them into account. We are still dealing with RTL, so uh, in order to do the analysis with static analysis, what we'll do is we'll do a very quick synthesis in the background. And we'll have a structural view of the design that results from that. In functional safety, what was there before? So functional safety, typically uh, users uh, have done things fairly manually. So there are several techniques that are used, uh, pr processes including FMEDA, failure mode effect diagnosis analysis, you know, using spreadsheets, analyzing block, block by block to do some planning. And then for sign off and calculating the metrics, people have been using you know, fault injection, fault simulation, uh, tools like Zoix that we have at, uh, so now you've got a couple of things that are compounding this, right? You have the fact that these chips are being developed at 5, 7 nanometers, which is just a lot more things to consider. And then you also have the fact that you've got functional safety overlaid on this, so it now has to function for, what, sometimes 15 years, 20 years in the market? That's right. So the purpose of the analysis is to ensure that we can understand what happens to the silicon after it's manufactured. So, you know, if you have a cell phone, for example, uh, our goal is to make sure that when we manufacture the chip that uh, we test it properly and then it's defect-free. Then we can put it in the phone and then the phone will last two, four years. And uh, we don't have to worry about silicon aging, for example. So in autonomous driving cars, a car is expected to last 15, 18 years. We all of a sudden have to actually think about what is going to happen to that silicon through that life cycle. And that means things like aging, the silicon can actually uh, age, deteriorate in terms of parametrics, or even random defect can appear. Or um, things like soft airs you know, from natural radiation in the air can actually hit the device at any point in time. And electromigration becomes much more of a problem over of that course, period. Of course, that's part of one of the aging uh, mechanisms that we have to uh, consider.
So how does static analysis work here? Yes, so uh, I mentioned we do a quick synthesis in the background and we end up with a structural representation of the design. So you could have, for example, some registers, some combination logic, and other registers at the other end. And what we do with static analysis is instead of doing simulation where we use uh, vectors, we actually can do this by analyzing purely the structure of the design. So we will be able to calculate, you know, for every nest in the design, what is the probability that the thing will be a zero or a one? And from there, um, if, uh, you know, we're trying to analyze the effect of a defect um, on functional safety, we can just through uh, uh, mathematics and, and calculating controllabilities, observabilities, and propagating probabilities, we're able to determine, for example, if a soft error hits this register, what is the probability that it's going to propagate and hit a critical signal <clears throat> that um, will create a crash, for example, re result in a crash. How much of this gets fed back into the uh, design here from the field as you're using these as well? So five years down the road, uh, latent defects start showing up. How does that filter back into the flow here? Well, so it, it means that uh, we need to be able to anticipate the probability of this happening and the location where this may happen. And then there are the, there's a standard called ISO 26262 that provides some guidance in terms of functional safety. There are some metrics that we need to calculate, and we need to calculate that fast. Right? This is why we have to scale in this methodology. And, and, and then uh, basically, you if you do not meet those metrics uh, at the start of your design, you have to take actions. So you have to introduce additional safety mechanisms and do it strategically in the right locations and then recalculate basically those metrics to find out whether you are okay or not from an ISO 26262 and functional safety standard point of view. And a lot of that has to be done by analysis because in the past when you thought about a server chip, for example, that's supposed to last for 10 years, you were literally able to throw it in an oven and bake it for a period of time and then take measurements. You can't do that kind of stuff with a seven nanometer chip. It won't work anymore. Well, you can still do burn-in, uh, for example, right? But the, the goal of burning is to, to get rid of uh, infant mortality. Here, we're looking uh, past that. We're looking for a much longer period of time. So, um, you know, uh, during the operation. So they're complementary to each other. One does not replace the other. So assuming you've got these tools and you're, you're working with them and you've done everything right, what kind of actionable information can you come up with? Very good. There are uh, two types that we're focusing on right now. One is uh, a little bit more architectural. So, for example, you have your, your design. It tends to be hierarchical. What we will do is we'll do the analysis. Um, with the static analysis, we're able to calculate metrics like the single point fault metric, the diagnostic coverage. And what we'll do is we will um, give you a hierarchical view of your design. And we'll be able to show you hotspots. Um, in other words, what are the uh, modules in your design that require more attention because the metrics for ISO 26262 are too low? So that's an architectural feedback, and then you can decide, oh, um, this particular module is a hotspot, I will, uh, you know, put redundancy to take care of it, and then we will update the metrics again based on that. So that's architectural. We also will complement that with a more fine granularity type of analysis. So for example, if you look at the, at the soft errors, soft errors can hit any register at any point in time. And um, one, one safety mechanism that people use to, to address that is triple modular redundancy. So you replace one flaw with three with a voting mechanism. And so that if the soft error hits any of them, you know, you will still get two out of three votes that will, be, that will work well. So it, w it will still operate properly. One of the problems with that redundancy is it adds weight and most of the, and it also adds cost. The car makers have been resistant to adding redundancy. They want different approaches, yes. right? Yes. So that's where this static analysis can help a great deal, actually. So um, what we're able to show with a partner customer early on that, um, for example, if they put triple modular redundancy in the entire design, the design more than doubled in size. Of course, that's not acceptable. And so with the analysis here and taking these constraints into account and calculating the probabilities, we were able to show that actually um, not all registers contribute equally to the probability of a, of a disaster, for example. So uh, what we do is we do the analysis and we're able to create an ordered list from the 
most critical flip-flop to the least critical one and to associate a weight with each one. And we calculate the initial metric and we know what the target metric is for A still D, for example, for ISO 26262. And then we can establish a cutoff point and say, if you replace all the flip-flops above that cutoff point with um, triple modular redundancy, you will actually be able to meet your metric. And with our partner customer, they were able to show that instead of doubling the design, we are able to achieve the metric, in their case, um, with only like 7% more, more area, which is much, much more acceptable. So this is all new to, the, for example, the automotive industry. What happens on the implementation flow? Uh, good question. Uh, scaling remains something that is of utmost importance at the denser nodes. So whereas before, a lot of the functional safety mechanism was, were inserted to some extent by hand into the design, we need more automation there. And we started doing that in, uh, in the digital implementation flow with the redundancy, for example, for software. So in the case of triple modular redundancy, um, what we do is that, remember, um, you know, the test max FUSA, the static analysis, is able to calculate this ordered list, uh, decide what are the flops that need to be replaced, then we can feed forward that information to our synthesis tools. You know, we have integrated those two together, and then the synthesis tool will go in, insert those uh, uh, triple modular redundant structures, and make sure that, for example, you have minimum spacing between the registers so that a single soft air will not hit more than one at the same time. And there are certain techniques that you need to uh, uh, implement at the physical design layer, splitting wires, again, to ensure the uh, one fault will not impact more than, than one flop. And then verify using uh, formal verification to like formality to make sure that all of this was done correctly. The automotive uh, design chain is changing almost on a regular basis. The, the, the rules are being set, they're being changed. Uh, and so does anything have to change in the flow? And if so, does that cause disruption? Well, our goal is to minimize the level of disruption. Uh, so, um, you know, the, uh, so it's, it's an evolution, so we're trying to minimize risk with our customers, make sure that we are not requiring them to change too much, but at the same time allow, allow them to scale and, and be able to design their chips in the tight cycles that are required to, to be competitive. Fadi Mamari, thanks for a great explanation. Thank you very much.